So in this lecture, I'd like to dive into a more extended example, kind of a case study of how we can use hierarchical models uh, in practice. It'll also invoke some of the uh, other approaches that we've learned over the last few weeks on how to relax assumptions of linear models. Uh, but before doing that, I wanted to quickly review some of the, the context uh, for thinking about hierarchical models and their advantages. So as a review, you know, fundamentally hierarchical models are intended to allow us to model the variability in the parameters of our model. Uh, they allow us to partition the variability in our predictions and our explanations uh, more explicitly into multiple terms. You know, you think about, for example, the idea of random effects might be able to partition uh, say a temporal effect versus a spatial effect or uh, you know, different spatial scales. They have the uh, advantage of allowing us to borrow strength across uh, multiple data sets. And as another reminder, uh, hierarchical models are hierarchical with respect to the parameters, uh, though in this case study we'll see how we can extend that to uh, models that are hierarchical with respect to data as well. Uh, and that a lot of the details in hierarchical models are, are in the subscripts, which indicate kind of which things are uh, hierarchical. Uh, so as a simple example, in our hierarchical mean model, uh, we might have you know, n data sets with a mean fit to each, uh, and then an estimate of the cross-site mean and the site-to-site -site variability. And we need a prior on the, that mean and across that variability. Uh, then within the each, within the data sets, we also have a estimate of the within site variability uh, and a prior on that. We also talked about extending uh, the study of random effects and extending that to uh, mixed effects models, which is the combination of random effects uh, with a fixed effects model, such as a linear model, where you might have you know, end data sets that are relationships between some X and Y. Uh, we'd have, you know, slopes, you know, kind of, in this case, a global estimate of the overall slope uh, with priors on that and its uh, variability. But then we'd also have uh, estimates of the alphas, which is how uh, in this in the traditional form formulation, how the intercepts vary from site to site. We talked in previous lectures how you could also formulate that to make the slopes vary from site to site as well. Uh, and then this estimate of the uh, across site variability and then some prior on that. And we also talked about how um, how accounting for different sources of variability can actually change how we make predictions with a model. So we talked about this example where the variance in both these two figures is the same, but in one, most of the variability is uh, site to site, and the other one, it's mostly year to year. And then you would make very different predictions uh, for a new year within a site that's already known uh, versus a new site in a year that's already known versus uh, actually making very similar predictions uh, if you're predicting to a new site in a new year because there you're completely out of sample and you really are sampling this overall variability but you uh, even if we don't know what's causing the site to site variability or year to year variability we can account for it and we also talked about the idea of starting simple and progressively adding complexity and that's uh, something that i'll continue to use in, in today's extended example. So to dive in, uh, today's example is going to explore models for tree allometry. So al allometric relationships are uh, relationships between, uh, de they describe uh, often the size relationships between different body parts of organisms. In this case, I'm looking at the relationship between the diameter of a tree uh, at uh, it's called breast height, 1.4 meters. Uh, so take a tape measure out in a forest and hold it up at kind of shoulder height and you wrap it around a tree and you measure its uh, circumference and from that you infer its diameter. And then the height of the tree 
uh, which we might get uh, usually with uh, uh, by measuring uh, the height, uh, measuring the angle, uh, you know, standing back from the tree, measuring the angle at the top and the bottom, and measuring the distance you uh, or away from the tree, and then doing a bit of trig. Uh, that said, these days uh, lidar-based estimates of tree height are uh, becoming available that are are far more precise than anything we can measure in the field, leading to the ironic case that our uh, our validation data uh, for lidar is much noisier than our cal than our actual observations. Um, in this particular case, I'm going to draw on a data set from my own dissertation that included and involved measuring uh, tree allometries for 53 temperate tree species, uh, total of almost 17,000. 1,700 tree observations uh, in a mixed temperate forest in, in North Carolina. So I'm going to have uh, um, both uh, hardwood and conifer species involved in this. Uh, this actually uh, corresponds to a paper I published now uh, well over a decade ago uh, about uh, the diversity and interspecific variability in tree allometries using a hierarchical approach, which is basically the first paper to really use uh, hierarchical bays in these allometric models. Uh, and I had to point out that uh, in, back in my earlier days of poor work-life balance, this was actually submitted uh, on the 4th of July in 2008, and uh, which was actually the day before my wedding, the 5th of July, 2008, because uh, I really, really needed to get this paper off of my plate before heading off on my honeymoon and heading off to start my first faculty job shortly thereafter. Um, a little bit of personal history with this one. So the motivation for this study uh, was basically that we are uh, very often fitting these allometric relationships in ecology uh, both uh, for theoretical purposes, you know, there's uh, questions about the the scaling of uh, organisms uh, and their allometric relationships, and then practical purposes. So very often, you know, we use, for example, uh, allometries between, say, tree diameter and tree biomass, or tree height and tree biomass, uh, to infer the biomass in a forest. Uh, without having to cut it down. So these kind of biomass allometries end up being very critical to a lot of terrestrial carbon budget work, uh, both theoretically and uh, practically in terms of things like carbon monitoring. Uh, one challenge though is that it can be difficult to fit uh, site and species specific relationships for these allometries, particularly as the diversity of forests the diversity in a forest increases, so you have more species and more and more rare species. Uh, what is often done, and I think is still the status quo in the tropics, is to resort to what are called global allometries, allometries that fit across all the species and ignore species to species differences or, or handle them uh, by including simple proxies uh, as covariates, such as wood density and assuming that wood density explains everything that causes different species to be different. Um, one thing that's important to note about uh, ig ignoring those sort of species to species differences is that those species to species differences are not random error, or the site to site differences are not necessarily random error. They can introduce biases, and, and those sorts of biases uh, do not average out with a, a large sample size. So unlike, you know, the the tree to tree variability that you might see in a real forest, uh, just because of the quirks of uh, history and growth and things like that, uh, you know, that that sort of variability, the residual error, uh, actually does average out quite quickly with as you increase your sample size, uh, but if there's systematic biases, those those don't average out. Um, it's also been noted that at least when this paper was published, that there had been a lot of attention paid to um, 
what these overall scaling relationships are, you know, what the you know overall exponent should be um, in these relationships, uh, but much less attention paid to what was causing uh, the interspecific variability in those relationships. So, you know, why were why was not every why, why doesn't every species follow the same exact relationship? Why is there species to species variability, and what explains that? Uh, in this uh, example, I'm going to um, focus on power law of relationships. These are relationships that take the form of uh, our y is some uh, scalar constant times uh, our x raised to some exponent b. Uh, these power law relationships are, are very common in allometric modeling. Like I said, there's a lot of theoretical interest in what these scaling exponents actually are. Um, in practice, um, we see if you take this power law relationship, and you take the log of both sides, you'll end up with a, a log log linear model where you know, the log of y equals some intercept plus some slope times the log of x, where b is that uh, slope. And that in practical terms, these relationships actually work quite well, and they have the advantage of taking on that log-log linear form. That said, there are definitely other um, allometric models out there being used. Um, and for example, the power law does not actually ever give a specific asymptotic value that some, uh, some relationships might have. Uh, the other reason that we use this is that it seems to work well in practice. It's, you know, if you look at this scatter plot, uh, this is actually a pretty darn linear relationship would meets the uh, assumptions of linear regression fairly well. Um, yeah, it works in practice. And and uh, on this log log scale, we see that the the variance is actually pretty constant. So so that also meets that assumption of homoscedasticity, uh, which you know, in a linear scale, it most definitely would not. In a linear scale. Uh, the variance uh, would be increasing as the size of the tree increases, which makes sense that the variability in tree height for a small tree is going to be much less than the variability in tree height for a large tree. But on a log scale, you know, that relative variability is actually fairly constant. So again, here this is just showing uh, that log-log uh, linearization of the power law relationship. So in the data set that I was dealing with, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we had a one of the challenges we were dealing with was uh, that of having rare species. So this is this graph shows how frequently different species showed up in the data set that I was working with. Again, there was 50 to 53 species. Um, so the mean species had 32 uh, observations, while the median only had 18. And I had uh, six species with only three to five observations. You know, so we have a, few, a small number of uh, common species that make up the, you know, a large fraction of the, the sample size. There's like one, two, three, four. You know, nine of those species had the sample size over 50. Um, while the, the remainders had much smaller sample size. And this was done ac actually not with a random sample of individuals in the forest. This was actually done after stratifying that sampling. The actual uh, abundances uh, within the, the actual forest itself is far more skewed. So why kind of take a hierarchical approach here? So we want to capture this variability across species in these uh, allometric relationships. So here what we're going to do is we're going to treat the regression parameters as coming from a common process, uh, but accounting for random species to species variability. So there's going to, you know, there's, there will be some overall uh, intercept and mean, uh, slope and intercept to the uh, kind of global allometric relationship, but then there will be species specific uh, slopes and intercepts. And then this estimate of, uh, the cross-species variability in those slopes and intercepts. So 
let's look at this hierarchical linear model graphically first. So here the x's are diameters, the y's are heights. I have this for 53 species. I'm going to come up with, in this case, the betas. Here is the vector of the intercept and slope. So I've got uh, 53 of those. And then I have this estimate of the, the residual error uh, around those allometric relationships. And, and for simplicity, I'm going to assume that that residual variability is shared, which um, is pretty consistent with the, the figure we just looked at, showing that that variance was pretty constant. So I need to have a prior on that. Uh, and then I have this estimate of the cross-site variability in intercept and slope. Again, this, this capital B here is a vector. These betas are a vector. And so the, this tau squared is the estimate of uh, a, you know, a cross species variability in the slope and intercept. And then I need priors on that. Writing this out more fully, I'm going to take h is the log of height, d is the log of diameter. And so we have h is normally distributed around a linear model of d. Uh, with some residual variable to sigma. Uh, our parameter model uh, describing the variability in uh, each of these b's, these betas, uh, which has a, a overall global mean and a cross site, a cross species variability, and then priors on the sigma, prior on the tau, and prior on the uh, across species means for the intercept and slope. If I took this overall model and looked at uh, the things being estimated and how we might estimate them. So first of all, the things that need to be estimated is the sigma, the tau, the global B, and then all of these betas. If we look at these, uh, we can see that we can actually give sample all of these. So the betas involve just the, our likelihood uh, times the parameter model, because those are the only terms that involve the betas. Uh, the sigma includes the likelihood and the prior on sigma. Uh, the global parameter values involve the parameter model um, times the prior on the b's, and then the tau, the estimate of across, a, across species variability includes the parameter model and the uh, prior on tau. So this figure shows an example of what these fits look like. And let me walk you through what we're looking at here. So first, uh, let's start on the left-hand side uh, with this column of three panels, uh, Acru is Acer rubrum, Nissa NYSY is Nissa Savatica, uh, and U-L-A-M, A-L is almost a lot of, so this is a maple, uh, tupelo, and, and elm. Uh, the black line with gray uh, interval estimate is the hierarchical model fit uh, to that data. So again, the hierarchical model is, is a linear model. Uh, the red line is the fit that you get just from LM. So this is uh, you know, just your traditional linear model. And then the, this blue, purplish blue horizontal line is an estimate from the uh, US Forest Service Silvix manual about what the adult height of these trees are. So you can kind of see uh, that the data sets uh, across all these species tend to peter out at that Estimate, you know, near that adult height. And, and again, the, uh, both the x and the y axis are uh, on a log scale. So this first left-hand column uh, represents common species. So these are species where we have large sample sizes and where our, uh, because we have large sample sizes, our estimates uh, from the hierarchical model and our estimates from just LM are, are pretty much uh, spot on the same because what we're seeing in that case is uh, that the large sample size uh, is overwhelming the prior, even though in this case, the prior is a, a 
a hierarchical uh, parameter model that actually has a def decent sample size itself. So the prior has uh, 53 data points associated with it for the 53 species. Uh, the middle column, uh, which is a, a walnut, oak, and uh, pine, uh, represents species that were that that had a you know they weren't specifically rare in the plot, but these were species that were only found in the canopy. They they were not reproducing in the stand, so there were no small or medium-sized individuals. There were only mature adults. And and because of that, we could only sample a relatively small range of sizes for these species. And you know the result of that is that the the fits from LM by itself often did not make sense. So in this case, you know, for this oak and this walnut, you know, the, the LM fits, the independent fits uh, that was not constrained at the hierarchical level actually predicted that trees uh, got, sh you know, started out very, very tall when their diameters were very, very small. And then as their diameters increased, the trees got shorter, uh, which is just biologically implausible. Uh, you know, that, that is not how plants grow. Uh, by contrast, this hierarchical model uh, shows a much more sensible relationship. It's, it's borrowing strength from the common species to say, uh, you know, I, I can tweak the slope and the intercept slightly to be able to go through uh, the observed data cloud. Uh, particularly in this case, I think the intercept is what will respond more. Uh, than the slope, but you know, because we have this hierarchical constraint that you know the slopes for these common species are all pretty similar, that kind of helps nudge the slopes for the um, species that were not well distributed um, to make sense and and you know share information about the general patterns for how trees grow from the common tr species, uh, and then the, in the right-hand column, we have species that tend to be in the understory. You can see this by the fact that their adult heights are a good bit lower than the other species. Uh, they, these also tend to be a little bit more rare. And again, we get much more biologically plausible fits for how these trees grow uh, by leveraging the hierarchical fit. So in, in this first case, you know, there was, would have been no relationship between diameter and height. In this second, uh, you know, the, the relationship was uh, much steeper than is biologically sensible uh, because it was only driven by, you know, three or four data points. And then in, again, in this last one, the, the relationship was very flat, flatter than uh, really is, is uh, plausible. Cool. So this was kind of the first stage of this analysis of, of building this hierarchical model. Uh, with this hierarchical uh, slope and the intercept. So we're allowing both the, essentially allowing a random effect on both the slope and the intercept. Uh, from there, I moved on and extended this model to say that the, the thing that I was interested in wasn't just the height of the tree, but I also had information about the, the radius of the canopy and the depth of the canopy. Um, and I was, in this case, I was actually interested in doing this modeling in order to uh, represent uh, trees in a, in a three-dimensional model of the canopy uh, for doing sort of these light analyses. In fact, I've, I've referred to that analysis uh, right at the beginning of this semester, uh, and I'll come back to it uh, a couple lectures from now about how we can combine information from uh, field measurements, models, and remote sensing uh, to understand the canopy light environment. In this case, uh, say we, we have, the, for a particular tree, we might have measurements of height, measurements of radius, and measurements of, actually, we had the raw data was measurements of height of the tree and, and the, the base of the crown. But from that, we can kind of derive the canopy depth. Um, and what I wanted to do is to fit these three variables simultaneously because I was concerned that there might be covariance uh, between these response variables, you know, for example, that a tree, you know, taller than average for that species might have a bigger canopy radius or might have a, a, a deeper crown. 
so that the residual errors uh, between these three variables might be related to each other. Uh, one of the things that I did here, uh, though, was uh, depth itself was challenging uh, as a direct variable because uh, there was essentially no way, uh, no easy way to enforce that uh, you wouldn't end up with a, a allometric relationship where this depth uh, had to be within the bounds of the height. You know, unless the slopes of those two relationships were exactly equal, those lo the, the height allometry and the depth allometry would cross at some point, uh, which is an, you know biologically impossible, um, no, geometrically impossible actually. Uh, so instead of m modeling uh, diameter uh, depth itself. What I instead did was uh, model depth as a proportion of the canopy. So now I took di the depth divided by the height. So what what fraction of the tree's height ha is covered by crown? And then to get that onto a similar scale uh, as the uh, other variables, because this otherwise was a zero one scale variable, I, I logit transform that to get it on a similar scale, uh, allowing me to fiddle a linear model uh, to all three variables. But now I have a vector of y's, uh, one diameter, but a vector of y's. The other challenge I encountered was that uh, there's not a single measure of canopy radius, but instead uh, in the field we measured the, the canopy radius two to eight times per tree because tree, trees just simply are not round. Uh, the tree crowns, you know, varied in, in uh, size and shape. And one thing that I could have done would have just been simply to average uh, these two to eight measurements and come up with an average value and then just put those in. Um, instead, what I did was to say that the actual true radius uh, of a crown is a latent variable uh, that is measured with uncertainty. So essentially using the same idea as the errors and variables model. You know, if I just averaged those values, I would have lost uh, my estimates of the uncertainties in those canopy radiuses. So here, uh, the mean canopy radius for an individual is informed by uh, each of the individ J individual cannibal radii measurements. Um, then we quickly found that um, not only was there variability in crown radius, but the, um, this was definitively a heteroscedastic relationship. As the trees got bigger, uh, they got more variable in their uh, canopy radius. Uh, in an absolute sense, they got more variable. Uh, so we then had to add a, a heteroscedastic model. In this case, I'm just uh, scaling uh, the canopy radius variability with dbh. I didn't have an intercept on here. I just have a, a essentially a slope. So now uh, I end up with a, a condition where I potentially can partition the variability in crown uh, radius uh, into a within species, within an individual component here in this, this canopy radius model. So I'm now looking at within individual variability in tree crowns. I can look at across individual variability within a species uh, from the, the allometric uh, model. And I could then look at the across species variability uh, with the hierarchical effect. Uh, so this is what part of that partitioning looks like. Uh, so the, um, the solid black line is the, um, relationship we get for describing the canopy radius variability and how that increases uh, within individuals from that was just coming from the last slide. And then uh, the green dotted line is how the canopy radius uh, varies across individuals. And that's coming from the allometric model. Um, so we're actually seeing that for small individuals in the understory, uh, the cross species, the cross individual and within individual variability in canopy radius is similar. 
uh, but as trees get larger, uh, there's actually more variability in canopy radius within a single tree than there is across the means uh, across individuals. So here's the results of this model for a single species. In this case, I'm looking at uh, a red oak species. And uh, here's diameter on the x-axis and the, the y-axis. The top panel, we have the tree height allometry. This has now been back transformed to a, a linear scale. Uh, so this is a, a, you know, a power law relationship. Um, we have our uh, relative canopy depth uh, model, in this case showing that about, on average, about 40% of uh, an individual tree's height uh, has canopy associated with it. Um, and that that increases uh, slightly, uh, but not a lot as the trees get larger. And then finally, we have this canopy radius model where the, the small blue dots here are the individual radii measurements. Uh, at, a, in, at a given diameter, there should be, again, two to eight of those. Uh, the red dots are the means across those, and we can see the overall allometric models uh, you know, across the means. And the, again, we can see that there's actually uh, a good bit more variability uh, within individuals than there is across individuals. Okay, so now we've moved from a, a univariate hierarchical model to a, a multivariate hierarchical model. Um, what I wanna do now is uh, extend this uh, one step forward and think about the idea of hierarchical covariate. So in the standard hierarchical model, because we're, kind of, we're thinking about hier hierarchical with respect to parameters, uh, we might have a parameter model that just says, you know, the individual betas, uh, say, are normally distributed with some mean and some across species variability. But there might be factors uh, that might explain some of that across species variability. We might actually have uh, interesting and important uh, hypotheses about what are the factors that affect that variability. That may actually be one of our key scientific questions in an analysis like this. Uh, so here, I'm going to replace that overall estimate of uh, means. You know, in this case, this B was just uh, a vector of uh, gave me the mean intercept and the mean slope. And then I'm going to replace that with uh, a linear model where Z is a set of across species covariates. So you know, uh, you know, before I had an X and a Y where the Y is the individual level observations uh, and X's are the individual level covariates. And now I have this Z's, which is this hierarchical level covariates that I'm using to try to explain the variability in the betas. And in this particular case, what I looked at was uh, shade tolerance, uh, the idea that you know the, the shapes of trees might change depending on whether they are light loving or shade loving. Uh, the strength of the wood might affect its allometry. So this is not, not, not density, but actually a measure of wood strength. Uh, and then a simple categorical variable of whether I'm looking at a, an angiosperm or a gymnosperm. So mostly a hardwood versus a conifer. Uh, and here's uh, an example of what these hierarchical models predict. And so here uh, is shade tolerance, which I've looked at in terms of you know, five, I'm showing five discrete bins going from tolerant to intolerant. And we see that uh, there actually is an effect of shade tolerance on all of these allometries, particularly you know, uh, for a given diameter, uh, shade tolerant species are shorter uh, than shade intolerant species. Uh, for a given diameter, the shade tolerant species have a deeper canopy depth uh, than the shade intolerant species. And then the shade tolerant species have a, a wider canopy radius. Uh, so 
kind of corresponding to somewhat our classic expectation that you know our fast growing light loving species are taller but with narrower uh, shallower canopies uh, but our shade tolerant species uh, are shorter but broader uh, and, and have deeper canopies. <coughs> uh, this other set of panels looks at the relationship between wood strength and the canopy allometries. We'll see that the height and canopy radius actually have very little influence. That, so uh, wood strength is very little influence on, canopy, on overall tree height or canopy radius, uh, but does have an effect uh, on the canopy depth. So uh, in this case, uh, stronger woods actually have a, a less deep crown. So one of the neat things about this hierarchical model structure is that it allows us to think about how we would make uh, predictions. Um, so we, we've already thought about how we can borrow strength uh, to improve our understanding of species that are poorly measured. But if you take that to the limit, you would ask, well, what, is, what would I infer about a species that's never been measured at all? So the hierarchical model actually allows us to make predictions about an unobserved species. Um, and we could do that even from the very beginning with the simplest hierarchical model uh, that wasn't multivariate and didn't have covariates. That said, once we added uh, the hierarchical covariates, we could actually refine those predictions by knowing the hierarchical covariates. So you know, first I could start and just say, you know, first I have this overall relationship that tells me, you know, what's the, the general pattern for how trees grow. Uh, and that would allow me to say, and if I encountered a new species, it's going to grow like a tree. Um, I have a basis for making that prediction, and I can do that by sampling from the global uh, relationship and predicting the whole distribution of, of slopes and intercepts. Um, if I then say I have a new, I've encountered a new species, and I know uh, that it's an angiosperm, and I know that it's shade tolerant, and I know that it has strong wood. I can actually narrow down the predictions of what those allometric covariates, uh, allometric parameters could be. The slope and the intercept are more constrained knowing what those across species covariates are. Uh, if we're encountering a new species, we actually would be able to update uh, those parameters with relatively small number of observations because we are now starting with informed of priors. You know, we have priors that's, that give us a good bit of constraint. And so like we saw, uh, you know, with the trees that were only observed uh, in, as adults, you know, even though we had a relatively small number of observations, we could, uh, you know, that would still pull those um, parameters to ensure that they go through the observations. Uh, and it's also noting that this general structure can easily be extended to other forms of dependence. Uh, so I could have, instead of adding uh, hierarchical covariates about species, I could have also added hierarchical covariates about uh, site characteristics. I could have also put, since this was an across species analysis, I could have put a phylogenetic constraint that was more sophisticated than just angiosperm, gymnosperm. Um, and there's a lot of other things I could do uh, at that hierarchical level extend uh, the model. So in summary, our final allometrical model ended up being a multivariate hierarchical linear model, multivariate because we were fitting three response variables at once. We had a hierarchical set of covariates. We had uh, accounted for the heteroscedasticity uh, in the, the canopy radius. We accounted for the area errors and variables in that canopy radius and treating it as a latent variable. Uh, we borrowed strength in our hierarchical model to address the fact that we had highly unbalanced data and were able to make uh, sound inferences uh, about rare species by borrowing strength. 